Hello and salams. I'm Rabia and welcome to Hidayah's new podcast, It's the Meh, which means listen, bringing you cutting edge dialogue on what it means to be LGBTQI plus and Muslim. Hidayah are the fastest growing LGBTQI plus Muslim organisation that provides a vital nationwide support system for us and by us. The word Hidayah derives from the Arabic word for guidance. This podcast will be discussing raw and personal stories from our members so you can better understand what life is like for us. Today, we'll be sharing Muslim stories. Joining us today, we have Sunny, a new member of Hidayah who grew up in Saudi and is a PhD student, Ibrahim, who's worked in gay men's sexual health for the last 15 years and is a member of Hidayah, and Amber, a volunteer for Hidayah and works in fintech. Tell us about a pivotal point in your life where your Muslim identity became very apparent to you, especially as an LGBT plus Muslim. It, I think my Muslim identity has always been there. And uh, like everybody else, I'm sure in my formative years and in my early 20s, maybe I went through a phase where I thought it was wrong to be Muslim and gay. When I met other gay Muslims, there was a turning point realizing that I wasn't the only one who was, you know, gay and Muslim. Mm. Wow, thank you. Sunny? Well, yeah, um, I guess growing up in Saudi, the Muslim is sort of beaten into you. <laughs> uh, it's everywhere. Um, so I wasn't really aware of that till I came to UK, um, where I've met people from other religion more openly and learned about other religions and then started to explore my sexuality, I guess. Um for a long time here, I thought I was the only Muslim one, though it is nice to identify with other LGBT queer um, people of different religions, but it still feels like there is a disconnect between them. Mm. And I, being a Muslim, but um, joining Hadaya was um, mind mind boggling. It was it was a t- turning point for me where I felt like I can discuss all these questions that I had in my mind with other people, other Muslim gay people. And yeah, so I feel like that was the the point of me realizing a Muslim um, pansexual person. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Amber. Yeah. Um, so I guess it was kind of the early 20s is when it started becoming a bit more apparent. And that's because I was faced with, um, you know, being a bit more independent, having my first job, finished university, um, encountering things like drinking culture in the UK. So a um, bit of context, I grew up in a kind of a more of a Asian uh, Muslim mixture of Hindu kind of um, school upbringing where I wasn't the minority as part of the majority. So it's really then that it became a bit more apparent that actually how do I navigate um, the world being Muslim? Um, and again, at the same sort of time, that's also when I was exploring certain things about my gender identity. So newfound independence, my own job, my own money, um, and also a coming-of-age kind of thing. Mm. Um, All of that played into uh, Muslim identity being quite front and centre about what I needed to work out Mm. with all those things going on. (laughs) So what is the most significant story that has shaped you as a person, especially as an LGBT plus Muslim? Five, six years back, um, we're as a Pakistani Muslim um, culture that dictates you're going to get arranged marriage. And my mom was looking for someone to get me married to. And I was at with my partner at the time, who was a female. Um, and it was hidden. And that was one of the things that would come up between our, our relationship a lot. And um, it would just so happen that things wouldn't work out and I would get rejected most of the time. But there was this, this one um, proposal that came and it was sort of everything was clicking, it was working. And I was very hesitant as to how am I going to get out of it now um, when my mom suggested that she's going to do istikhara mm. and she's going to get her Quran teacher to do istikhara. And would you like to explain what that is? Um, so istikhara is a special prayer that you do and then asking um, Allah whether the decision that you want to make or about to make would work out for you or not. And usually um, it could be in a dream format as well, where you get a dream that gives you a sign as to what it, it might be, or things may or may not work out according to that. But it was like, it's a special prayer, okay. um, asking for guidance, basically. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and I actually do believe in that. Some people might not, but at that time I was like, 
oh crap. Because if being gay is wrong, if being the way I am is wrong, the istara, istakhara is going to show, marry this person. Because whether this person is right for me or not doesn't matter because being with a girl is wrong and being with a guy is right. So God will automatically, in my logical head, would have given the istakhara a go. And how am I then going to get out of it? Um, but it turned out that the my mom's Quran teacher, her dream, um, I've not shared this with a lot of people, but I feel like was the biggest significant thing um, in my personal life was they start, uh, she dreamt that I was in an abaya. I was covered. I was, and there was light coming out of me, but then there was this other things that are attacking me, yet I was reflecting them very well and I was strong and stead in my way. Um, so she interpreted it as there's something that is wrong with the with the guy that, that I'm going to have difficulty with. And slowly it turned out that he was a very different sect and very different rigid kind of Muslim. Uh -huh. And I did not believe in those um, values or rituals and things. And at that point, that was the change. It's like if God didn't appreciate who I was, he would have whatever that life might have been like, wrong for me, obviously, would have just said, oh yeah, marry this person. That should have, the Sahara should have come out positive, but it didn't. And that's where I felt at peace for being who I was. Because mm -hmm. it was sort of like a sign from God saying, you know what, it's okay. I'm not, I'd rather you be with whoever you want rather than be with the wrong person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the story that sticks out to me the most. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I had a bunch of those as well. I'm a very indecisive person. So during my university years and college years as well, I was more religious um, and a specific kind of religious, which was more around rules, regulations, that type of um, kind of um, commitment to it, religion, if you will. Mm -hmm. But something that you kind of born with and um, grew up with and you think this is the way things are and you continue and you get better and better at it mm -hmm. and you become, you get everything you need, you do a you do all these things. You buy by everything. Um, and the turning point for me was um, kind of starting work, being exposed to a different groups of people. I know it sounds strange, but, um, you know, obviously I grew up with the TV and all that. I knew what, you know, white people were, etc. cetera. But um, you begin to meet different types of people as well. Um, and, you know, like eventually you get to a point where I'm trying to reconcile this kind of gender identity thing that I've had ever since I was young to with Islam. And in terms of the certain little nooks and crannies of Islam I got into, which were not really understanding of anything to do with gay or lesbian or anything like that, um, it drove me to, well, I must reject myself or reject Islam mm. or something. Mm. Um, so I took a kind of sabbatical, if you will, you know, that famous Kanye lyric, mm. Um, I'll be, I told God I'll be back in a second. Hey. Man, it's so hard to act reckless. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that. That's so that's kind story. of what I did. I completely flipped. It was like a bungee cord. I was held by this elastic band of religion and completely went the other way, um, completely exposing myself. I wanted to do as, as much as outreach as I possibly could into the LGBT community. So I want to meet as many trans people as I can, as many gay people as I can, etc. So I thought at the time, being so naive, it's all in the clubs. Just go to the clubs, you'll meet them all, everything will be crystal clear. And actually, I wish I hadn't stayed in that particular world, although it was a path I needed to go through mm. to understand everything as long as I did. I wish I found things like support groups earlier. I wish I found things like Hidayah earlier. Um, and But... I think what kind of brought it full circle for me back into like where we are today in, in Hadaya and talking about these things is um, I just found um, a kind of gap of spiritual, um, you know, explanation of everything that happens. I had it before and I've lost it. And so I, that gap was missing. And I found some just lectures and things like that on YouTube about Far Eastern religion, Buddhism, etc. For the first time I had the permission to properly study different religions mm -hmm. and not feel guilty about it or not feel like I'm committing shirk by trying something new. Um, and eventually it brought me back into sort of that spiritual side of Islam that I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that was kind of 
been the most pivotal kind of transformation for me, really. Who for him? I think for me, I grew up in a household where religion wasn't really pushed down our throats. Oh. Our parents were like, okay, we're Muslim. There was, like, I would say we weren't rigid in our practices, mm. but my mother was somebody I was close to and I watched her. And what she used to do is, like every Thursday night, did a Fatiha for people who had passed away. For 10 days of Muharram, when I was a little kid, she'd go to Majlis and we're Sunni. So a lot of people think, you know, especially nowadays, people think Muharram and Majlis are only for Shias, when it's not. It's for Muslims, for everyone. And understanding the importance of the 10 days of Karbala, etc. And I remember I used to go to Majlis with my mother. And also my mother would also, you know, like I suppose I'd describe her now as a Sufi more than, you know, what if you want to find a word to describe her. And I was about 13 or 14 and I went with her to a shrine for the first time and I didn't know what the etiquette was. And all she said to me is, we go in and we pray. And she goes, whatever you ask for, you ask for their help to ask Allah for you. And that is it. And everything I asked for came true except the one thing. And that was, I said, if being gay is wrong, please help me wake up and not be gay. And that to me, I felt all my answers were there. Everything else I'd asked for that day at the shrine, you know, I got. So I thought this too as a sexuality, as my sexuality was basically, it's okay. But having said that, then there were certain Islamic principles you have to apply to, you know, your life, whether you're gay, straight, by whatever. And I think I've lived by those principles, you know, like promiscuity being frowned upon. So making sure that, you know, we all have needs, we all have urges, etc. But trying not to be, you know, 24 seven on grinder, or, you know, like, in those days, we didn't have that anyway. But you know, going out and meeting people just for promiscuous sex, rather than trying to find a relationship where, in the eyes of Allah, it is better to be with one person, I feel, you know, in a long term relationship than it is to sleep with several people. Because even as a heterosexual Muslim, I think Allah frowns upon you if you were to lead that lifestyle. Mm. But that isn't just my personal opinion. And, you know, and everybody has the right to live their life how they want to, you know. And I think that was one of the, the points, as I said, when I was, uh, I was young. And also my mother, I think, realized very long time ago. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I, um, someone had an arranged marriage in the family. And I went to her and I said, when it's time for my arranged marriage, make sure you find me a really nice boy. And she smiled and looked at me and she goes, when it's time, you make sure you find yourself a nice boy. And I remember once um, I was at an aunt's house and uh, my cousin and I were both like complaining about being single. This is in our early 20s. We were like, oh, no, will we ever get married? No. And then my aunt was cooking and she shouted, don't worry, you'll both find good boys for yourselves. So it was one of those things. And I just, you know, the elders were just giving me a message saying it was OK to be who I was. That's lovely. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and also my mother had always said to me, she goes, whatever happens to you, just make sure that um, you be a good person. You, you know, you're nice to people, you know, you're kind to people, you don't hurt people, and most importantly, don't forget Allah. Mm. That was the only thing she said to me, and be yourself. Mm. So for me, that was, again, a message just telling me, you know, who I was and what I was is fine. I think many years later, when I worked at the NAS project, um, doing presentations and meeting a lot of imams, mm. and I think that was when the messages were coming through, when a lot of the imams were like, you know, they were allies. You know, when you met them in public, they were not. And when in private, they'd say, you know what, we understand, we support, but we cannot say it because of fear of rejection from the congregation. I remember one of the things working at the NAS Project London was asking people to do a sermon on, you know, for World AIDS Day. And they refused. And I went to several mosques weeks before asking them, please, this is something you should consider. And they were like, no, you know what? The community will not accept it. The congregation will not accept it. You know, they they have a standing in the community and they need to think about everybody. And it wasn't yeah. something they were going to discuss. But privately, they were all, you know, we we're all saying the same thing. But one of the things that came up time and again was, you know, when people said, is it wrong for me to be gay? They would say, Allah would be happier with you if you found one person of the same sex to spend your life with than to get married to a person of the opposite sex and cheat on them with several people of the same sex through your life. And I think that was a strong message that I gave out to a lot of people when I was working, saying this is something you need to think about. So, I mean, I'm talking about when parents came to see me, for example, saying, you know, how can we change our son or, you know, my son's gay and I don't know what to do about it. You know, I want him to get married to a woman. You had to explain what it was. Mm. I think one of the other things also, I did a conference in Manchester where it was a huge crowd of Muslims. And there was me and there was a lady from the Jewish um, um, 
Jewish community who was, and, and we, we had worked together a few times, so every time we'd stand up, we'd laugh and say, okay, our speech is very similar because we work, you know, together. But one of the things was a lot of the crowd there, all the Muslims were like, it is wrong to be gay and Muslim. And I said something and I said, look, a lot of the times people who are gay are forced to marry a person of the opposite sex because the family think it will change them. And I said, can I have a show of hands here who thinks it's okay to do that, you know? And they all raised their hands, or all the Muslims did. And I said, do you think it's okay now if you found out that your daughter, your son, your brother, your sister was married to somebody because their family found out that they were gay? And now they wanted them to marry your child or your sibling because they thought, you know what, it'll make them better. Would you still agree with that? And people didn't. And I said, just understand you know what, every gay person marries somebody, that person they marry of the opposite sex who they're being forced to marry has a life as well and they have a, you know, they have urges and desires and a, and a sexual need which this person will not be able to fulfill. So think about everyone, don't really just be selfish, think about yourself. Um, what is the most challenging thing uh, about being an LGBT plus Muslim? The most challenging thing for me, being trans, is kind of going through that transformation in front of um, your family, um, particularly your family, but also, you know, your friends. Um, so it's it's a lot more apparent um, what you're going through as a transformation and for them to reconcile what this means for Islam at the same time as you're doing it. Mm. Um, that's incredibly challenging because then you don't really have some kind of stable bedrock for you to say, right, this is my ideal where I want to get to and I need support to get there, but your support are going through going through it as well, not just you. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of things I can go through, lots of little mini situations that just re-bring, re- re-bring things back to um, how difficult it is. Would you like to share an example with us maybe? Um, so just the simple fact of, for example, living with your parents, um, you know, and you're, you're trying to explore what gender identity means for you. So you might want to leave the house in a certain presentation, and that can be uncomfortable for the parents involved and, and your, your neighbours or whoever. To be fair, neighbours have been fine. <laughs> um, it's more just the, the perception that your parents have about what they think you're doing it for and what you know what, you're, what you need to do to do it. Um, and to sometimes to have to just put faith that things are going to work out and that things will roughly fall into place um, and that you can only be as brave as you can. Sunny? I think for me personally, it's the guilt that I'm putting my family through because I may be, yeah, because I may be okay with who I am and I might accept me, but I know it's such a cognitive dissonance for them to understand. I empathize with them. I completely empathize with all the all the parents who are afraid for their children. They may be showing it in I'm not making any excuse for how they behave, but it might come out in an aggressive way, but it's again being rooted from fear. They're afraid what the society may do to them or you. Um growing up in Saudi, like I said, um it's illegal to be gay. It's you you you're punishable by death. Um, being an expat in Saudi, it's a different scenario altogether where you're probably punishable to death. Well, definitely punishable to death, but your pro- your family will probably be deported as well. So you're not just making a decision for you, but you're connected to all these people. And then you think, hmm, I, I, do I just stay the way I am and pretend to be normal, quotation marks, whatever normal is, um, and just live the life they ask me to? Or should I be true to myself and put them in that sort of danger? Um, I know it's not the case in, in UK as much, but in Pakistan and Saudi, it's still still a huge backlash that that people will have to deal with if you come out as gay, pan, or whatever. So I think for me, that that's the biggest concern I have. I'm not out to my family. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I was like, mm, if I find, considering being pan, I feel like it's a bit easy if it's a guy, lucky me, <laughs> everything <laughs> fits. But if it's a girl, then might as well put them through the pain when I need to. Yeah. But yeah, that part of me I'm not okay with. I feel the guilt and I wish I didn't have to. I think that's a 
difficult thing to do. Very difficult, mm. very traumatic. Ibrahim? Mm. I think we face challenges every day, but um, my main challenges have come from a very young age. I never came out. I don't think I'm the straightest bunch that came out of the closet, so I think I never had to. Um, people just assumed about, about my sexuality and I just let them assume. Um, what's been a challenge with me, I think there was a time in my early middle 20s when I was sat down by my father and my brother and they asked me about marriage and I said I wasn't ready to get married. And they said, oh, there are rumors about your deviant lifestyle. And I said, um, and I remember, you know, I was a child of the 80s. I was dyeing my hair and, you know, you know, wearing makeup a bit. You know, I'm quite proud of that, which is quite fun. <laughs> but um, they sort of said to me, we just want you to be aware of one fact. And that is, if you ever have a relationship or you have a partner, it will never be okay for him to come home and meet us. So we don't ever want to know about who you're seeing or whether you're single or not, or you're married or not to somebody of the same sex, because that will never be accepted. And to this day, none of my family has ever known anything about my personal life, and I've kept it that way. But having said that, a little bit about what, like as Sunny said earlier, my family is, I do come from a slightly prominent family, and I have to be aware of their reputation as well as to how I behave. And I feel that also is a challenge, but I mean, it's something I do quite easily. So I make sure, you know, you just don't hook up or get involved or be involved with anybody who you think will have a link back, who can, and also being aware of who's using you and who is just wanting to be with you because they genuinely want to be with you. Mm. And that also, I mean, as I've got older, I found a lot of younger people do that, especially now at the moment when a lot of people are here um, and, you know, for whatever reason, and they want to remain in the UK and the sort of thing, you know, finding an older man and maybe he'll, you know, marry us or we'll be with him or have a relationship with him. And you find at the moment you actually say, you know what, that's not something I'm entertaining. They just don't want to know you. So you're like, okay, so you just wanted to be, you know, so there's challenges everywhere, I think. But one of the main challenges of being gay and Muslim, yes, we have off days where you think, am I doing the right thing? Is Allah accepting me for who I am? But Alhamdulillah, uh, my my faith is very strong, and even if I have a bad day, I'll you know I'll just ask Allah for guidance, and I'll be fine. Alhamdulillah, and you know what? I carry on, and everything is going well. And hopefully, that's what I pray. And I think one thing we forget about is when we pray, we have to pray. And I do mention everybody who's facing challenges, and I mean entire mankind, not only Muslims, but I do pray for the LGBT community, and I do pray for those Muslims who are stuck in countries where it's illegal to be gay. Mm -hmm. And especially when you hear stories about, you know, ISIS and Daesh, whatever they are, throwing people off buildings and stuff. And that becomes painful or Iran hanging people. So you pray for them. And I also think when you're doing Fatiha, just remember those people, you know, remember yeah. their souls and pray for their souls. I mean, Absolutely. that's important, which people forget. I mean, we're all young at the moment. Well, not all, not me, but you know what? People are young at the moment, you tend to forget, but there is, you know, and as Islam states, if you're Muslim, that's why we're here. There is life after death, and we need to remember those people who have passed on before us and pray for them. I really want to sort of explore what your experiences have been, uh, you know, being an LGBT plus Muslim uh, within the wider LGBT plus community. Um, Sunny? I think, well, again, um, I think they are very accepting, but I don't, I'm not going to be much of a help there because I thought I was the first proper organization that I've been out to. Um, I feel like, it, again, like there was a disconnect where um, when I would talk to other gay um, or LGBT group that were Christian or not Muslim. Major, majority of them didn't follow religion. So in their head, concept of God or your guilt or your questions and your battle of whether you're right or wrong didn't exist. Mm. Um, so, and they didn't understand where I was coming from because in their head, again, there is that conception of, are you sure you're gay and religious? That doesn't go hand in hand. Um, but I don't know if it's because they didn't grow up with the faith that they 
they were chosen or born with. Um, it's easy to say I'm agnostic or atheist nowadays. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I found um, talking to other, like a wider LGBT group, I suppose. They don't have the same problems or the same questions or the same queries that we may have. Um, they, well, over here, what I found in general was definitely don't have the same um, experiences that we have in regards to um, family or their responsibility towards family. Um, it's because I've heard it's so simple for them. It's like, just don't talk to your parents. And you go like, that's not possible. I cannot cut off from my family. That is just, that is not a thing for me. Whereas I've been told, just don't talk to them. And that concept is yeah. very, very foreign to me. Mm. I think that, that there's a disconnect there. Hidayah has really been the first kind of group that I've properly started to engage with the LGBT and Muslim community. Um, prior to that, again, like I was mentioning, I was out clubbing, doing all this stuff, and thought that's where I can meet people who are LGBT. <clears throat> and because I guess because they're in a certain space and time in their lives and journeys, that they're not focused on religion per se. Mm -hmm. They're also in that kind of very wide open, let's explore everything, including being as hedonistic as possible, mm. um, to numb whatever pain they might be going through. And I think it takes time to accept you where that's no longer where you're going to find peace. Um, and peace comes back to, um, you know, reconfiguring everything in your life, family, friends and everything letting go of it, that ideal that you thought you might have, um, realizing that it might not be possible, and you create a new ideal that will work. So it's about coming out for me um, mm. and then going through that process with my parents. Um, my mum was a bit more accepting. <clears throat> she, in a way, knew it was coming. My dad also knew it was coming, but he never let on that he ever thought he'd have to confront something like this. Mm. And his advice is completely um, more logical in terms of, well, that's fine, you're trans, but have you thought about not being trans and doing this, getting married, da -da -da, play the thada, all that, etc. Um, and again, just being brave, again, I'm mentioning to see what happens because you can't quite predict. So when I came out to my eldest auntie, um, she started telling me a story of another trans person on her side of the family um, that I didn't know about and obviously has been kept under the... That story is, you know, reserved for very special people in the group. Maybe it gets lost in the generations. Um, and how that particular story went, because it was some time ago, it didn't go very well, let's say. It was, it was a sad story. Um, and so she was adamant, I don't want that to happen to you. So if there's anything you need, you let me know and I will support you in any way I can. And whatever you decide you want to do, whether it's to not transition or to transition or whatever, the key is that you must be happy. And I think that's the type of messaging you might get from things like aunties and uncles rather than your own parents because they're so scared to tell you that even though they feel it because they feel they don't want to push the boat or push you in a certain direction they don't know as well they're on a journey with you mm. it's fear of your safety basically yeah yeah, yeah they fear oh will I be happy does this person know what they're doing well do you <sighs> um, mm. I have to do this thing for me and yeah. yeah it's a basic misconception where they think it's a choice rather than who you are they yeah. think you choose to be LGBT and you could just not like if we could stop, then do you not think that we went through that process? Ibrahim, you have, uh, you're very wise because of all, of all your experiences and seeing and experiencing the LGBT plus community throughout the decades, if you will. So would you like to talk to us a, a bit about that? I think I can say initially, um, talking about mid 80s onwards, you were okay in certain parts of London or in certain parts of the scene but a lot of the times we faced racism and a lot of uh, rejection from the LGBT community 
Um, in and then I think recently there was an exhibition about you know the queer Asian movement. I I actually I think in 1987 or 88 I fa- saw an ad at that time you know big Bollywood buff um, Stardust magazine and there was a little ad saying Are you gay? Do you want to talk to somebody? Call this number on a Sunday afternoon or whatever. And I remember calling and speaking to this person. And they said, oh, there is a group uh, we've just started, and it's called Shakti. And those are the first South Asian group. And I remember going to that and being very active in that group. And all the stories that came back were the same. We all wanted to find a connection with each other and be there to support one another. Because although not everyone, but nearly almost everyone had experienced some sort of rejection. Um, go down many years later when we decided to ma- to march for Pride. And we wore, you know, just to try and stand out of the crowd, wore hijabs, colourful hijabs, men and women. And this is 2007. And this was actually two or three weeks before the 7-7 bombings. And I remember when we were marching, and I remember some famous faces coming out and saying, hi, well done, you know, all that. But then we had a lot of gay people, people, members of the LGBT community coming up to us and saying, are you going to bomb this place now? And I remember that was something that really hurt a lot of us. Mm. We thought, you know, we're part of the community. We're not here to, you know, damage anyone or do anything. And yet, rather than accepting us, you're just basically discriminating against us. Mm. And I think that's happened. I remember there was a time when a friend and uh, a friend of mine and I went out somewhere to just for a drink, and he, and a, a part of the Shakti group. I mean, we supported one another. It it, it wasn't more about religion; it's about just being South Asian queer. So a Sikh friend of mine. And I went out to a pub and we walked in and everybody shut up and looked at us. And we thought, oh, well, it's a gay pub. Let's just go and sit at the bar and order a drink. Mm. So we ordered a drink each. And the guy just said, um, make sure when you finish that, um, you get out of here. We don't like your sort in here. <sighs> and that was, we were calling those as a penny farthing in Hammersmith. But it was quite, you know, and we were like quite shocked. And it wasn't the first time that had happened. It had happened to several people several times. So, I mean, I think, it, you know, things are changing now. But the other thing you had, the, the other side, the flip side of that was basically finding the people who wanted to be with you because you were exotic. It wasn't because of anything else. They wanted an exotic partner or to be with somebody. I've never been with an Indian before. You're like, well, yes, you know, we wrote the Kama Sutra, so you should have, <laughs> you know. So just understanding that, I mean, you know, you have all sides, but yes, there's been challenges all all through the years and things have got easier. But again, sometimes it's not been as easy. And I, I hear, and also I understand it's not easy for, I mean, it's probably easier to be in London than other parts of the UK. Mm. But uh, one of the things that comes out, uh, that's mentioned earlier as well is, they all always tell you that you should come out, you know, you have to be true to yourself. You know, you have to tell your parents, tell your family, tell, you know, your friends. You, and it's not that easy. No. They don't understand. And I'll, I'd always tell somebody if they wanted to come out is you look at your situation in your safety first. Mm. Do you have people who might want to harm you as a result of you coming out? Then it's not worth it. You know your family. You know what you've got to lose. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I, like I had a friend who had worked with his father to build up a business and he had two siblings who had nothing to do with the business. And the moment he came out, his father was okay with it, but not happy. And then the father retired and decided to sell the business. And you're talking about a huge business worth millions. And he left him with very little. He goes, well, you're gay. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. And everything was left to the other siblings who were very successful. And he goes, well, you're not going to give me any grandchildren anyway, so you don't need much money. You can go and make your own. So in a understanding when it's okay to come out and understanding your own situation and not really giving into pressure and not you know and just being aware of doing what's best for you yeah i think that's that's important so the lgbt community do not understand that it's not as easy being gay muslim than it as is it for other people final question what is the most important story people should know about you to best understand you and your journey. So I can look at it more like thematically. Sure. What are the things that shape me the most? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's been about facing shame and guilt um, and kind of working through that anyway. So I think I've grown the most whenever I've done that Mm. as a person. 
Um, so whenever I'm faced in a situation where, oh, this is, I'm a bit guilty about this, shouldn't be doing this, or, you know, oh, what am I putting my parents through, etc. But then I plough on with it anyway, in terms of keeping that in mind. But um, the worst kind of scenario doesn't play out, usually, and what ends up happening is something I probably couldn't have predicted. Um, yeah, so that's very, like, very conceptual story. <laughs> I think for me... It's just for people to realise my sexuality is a small part of me. I'm the same brother, the same son, the same uncle, the same great uncle, the same you know neighbour, the same cousin, whoever you want me to be. My sexuality is just a small part of me. So it, whereas they choose to find companionship with a person of the opposite sex, I choose to find companionship with a person of the same sex. And that's all. There's nothing else. It's not a big song and dance about everything else. I'm still the same Muslim. I still pray to the same God. I still do everything else that they do. And I'm still accepted, you know, most of the time with the same people. Very few people who, you know, I think I've come to an age where if people, you know, don't really want to engage with me, then, you know, goodbye and good luck. I don't mind. But having said that, I'm the same person. What my sexuality does not define me and who I am. There's a lot more to me as a person then, you know, my sexuality is a small part of me. And I think one of the things that does, um, I think with gay, when you say, you know, people don't think about lesbian or anything else, when you say the term gay, especially Muslims and the community think sodomy. All right, so you're a sodomite, you know, if you want to use that term. Mm -hmm. And it's just understanding that, you know what, that's a very small part of a gay man's life if they decide to practice it. Not everybody does practice it. And you know what? Being gay is about liking a person of the same sex. Yeah. And that's all there is to it. And it's a small part of my life. Everything else is the same as yours. Final Sorry. word, last word, oh. should I say, Sunny? I think, like Amber said, you can't um, pinpoint one story. But I think um, overall what I could say is finding peace within yourself or accepting who you are yourself. Because if you keep finding yourself through other people's eyes, you're never going to be satisfied. Um, like I know with my parents, um, they're because back home I've been threatened, um, with a lot of different things. Um, one of them being that we're gonna tell the authorities that she's gay, um, and that's gonna lead her to death and blah blah. Um, to my parents just going, oh, just just get married to prove everyone wrong, and I and I would be like, mom, even if it, I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Um, let's not even discuss about that. But that in itself is a wrong thing to do, to marry just to prove someone else right or wrong. But in but it also led me to believe like realize that my parents rather accept that something's under the rug. Like after that they've never questioned my sexuality or it came up where I was with a girl and somebody accused me of being with a girl. Um and they just took my word for it and then that's it. They don't want to know more. Um, they also said that if they found out that I'm dead to them and all and, you know, out of the family, um, they would kill me themselves, all of that. But I understand that it comes from a fear. And if I keep seeing myself through their eyes, I'm never going to be happy. I have to be happy with who I am and satisfied with who I am. And that's my business and everybody else can have their opinion of me is also theirs. It has nothing to do with me. I think that's the, the biggest thing I could learn from my own experience is that people's opinions of me are also theirs, has nothing to do with me. I don't take ownership of that. Well, some serious levels of self-reflection here. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much for listening. If you would like further information or support, head to our website at hidayahlgbt.co.uk. Hidayah is a support group that amplifies the voices of LGBTQI plus Muslims. We campaign for social justice to defeat the stigma, taboo and discrimination faced by many within our communities. Our aim is to gain social acceptance as LGBTQI plus Muslims. Thank you for listening and see you again very soon. <laughs>